Very well, counsel. As the uh, witness is coming to the stand, let me mention something. I had mentioned uh, this morning comments received from the Federal Bar Association and others simply for completeness of the record and to make sure that you have what is uh, submitted to the court, although it, it pertains to the change in the local rule. In view of the proceedings in the Supreme Court, I think completeness of the record calls for uh, that response of the Federal Bar Association to be made part of the record in this case, together with that submitted by the San Francisco Bar Association, an organization called the Equal Justice Society, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, and the American Civil Liberties Union, which appears to have been rather limber in its affiliations in this case. Uh, and <clears throat> in addition, um, correspondence from the director of the administrative office of the United States Courts to Chief Judge Kaczynski, dated January 8, 2010, and uh, Judge Kaczynski's response to um, Mr. Duff and to uh, Judge Sirica, the chairman of the executive committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States. To the extent any, ex extent any of these matters have any bearing on your further proceedings, they should be part of the record and you can uh, deal with them as you think is appropriate. But uh, you, sh you certainly should have access uh, to these. And so I'll direct that the clerk have these filed in the record. All right, uh, Mr. Cooper. And how, how exactly will we have access to these documents you just referenced, number one, and number two, will we have access as well to uh, the, the rest of this voluminous uh, collection of comments? you want to take a look at those 138,000-plus responses, I'd be delighted to have you do it. I don't think we want to burden the record with all of them. But uh, they are available, and um, I can't say I have read every one of them. But I've read many of them, but they're certainly available to everybody. But I thought the organizational um, responses, which deal specifically with the rules, uh, would be particularly helpful to you. And will those be uh, available through the, the PACER on the docket? Yes, sir. Thank you. Very well. Um, let me remind the witness, uh, you are still under oath. The oath that you took this morning applies to this part of your testimony. Do you understand that? I do. Very well. Mr. Rahm, I believe it is. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Very well. Good afternoon, Mr. Katami. Good afternoon. Uh, we met December 10th. Do you recall? I do. It's good to see you again. Thank you. I would like to draw your attention to Plaintiff's Exhibit 116, and if we could play that exhibit and uh, have you look at it, that would be helpful. <clears throat> Say 116? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Well, um, are you seeking to admit the exhibit, or are you just uh, showing it to the witness to see if it refreshes his recollection, or well, just Your as a matter of general interest, what's the... Uh, Your Honor, I'd like to show the witness the uh, video. It has to do with the issue of uh, Prop 8 campaign and uh, the theme that kids would be taught about same-sex marriage in the schools, which is something that he had testified to. My question is somewhat more limited. Are you moving the exhibit in? No, Your Honor, not at this time. I'd like him to, to, to view the, the uh, video and then um, identify it, and we will move it in uh, at the appropriate time. Your Honor, I had no objection to the video. That's how we get offered at this time. In, the, in that case, Your Honor, we move it into uh, evidence. Well, 
116 will be admitted. Californians have a lot to consider when they go to the polls on Proposition 8. There are many consequences for Californians should Proposition 8 fail to be enacted. Some of the most profound consequences are for children. In 2003, the Massachusetts Supreme Court legalized gay marriage, and it wasn't long afterwards that Rob and Robin Worthlin experienced those consequences firsthand. Well, in 2003, the Massachusetts Supreme Court uh, legalized marriage between homosexuals. And uh, it was to the acclaim of many, many people, but it caused a lot of concern for others. Concern that rights would be infringed, particularly if you disagreed with gay marriage. In March of 2006, our son came home from school and he said, our teacher read us the silliest book today. It was so funny. It was about a prince who married another prince, not a princess. And then they became the king and the king. And we were surprised. We thought maybe my, our son had gotten the details wrong. So we emailed the teacher and she called us back and told us, yes. This was actually being read aloud by the teacher in class. Well, we were surprised and really astonished because we felt like second grade is very young to be introducing the concept of homosexuality and gay marriage. We thought they would at least wait until they had sex ed in fifth or sixth grade. And it was just shocking that, you know, our son started talking about men marrying other men. What happened when you expressed your concerns to the school? Even though this book was not a part of the curriculum, it was something that they had to do. And we thought that we would be informed before they talked about matters involving human sexuality. When we asked them if they could let us know before they read books like this or talked about the subject, they said no. We decided that our only recourse was to turn to the courts. And so we, we went to the uh, first district court here in, in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and uh, the judge ruled against us. And some of the ruling I thought was very troubling. Um, to, to paraphrase, he suggested that the state must teach these things to children before they've had a chance to make up their own minds. What do California voters need to know about what happened in Massachusetts? Voters in California need to understand that while the love between two people may be real and genuine. To redefine marriage has an impact at every level of society, especially at the youngest levels of society, our children. And, and no longer is it okay to disagree that if you disagree with a particular lifestyle or behavior, you are now wrong, you are now bigoted. It's no longer a dis difference of opinion. You are wrong. Lexington Public Schools has come out with a new curriculum where they will teach about homosexuality and gay marriage in every topic. In math, in reading, in social studies, in spelling, there will be terms and concepts of homosexuality promoted at, in every subject, at every level, from kindergarten on up. Um, parents will have no right to object, and schools will roll this forth whether they like it or not. And the tolerance that the gay community cries out for is not demonstrated to people who have differing points of view. There is no tolerance. The hate, the, the disparaging remarks, the hostility that we face were so astonishing. When we sincerely wanted to um, just protect our children while they're children, not have them face adult issues while they're children. There's a long enough time in their life that they can work through adult issues. But we just wanted them to have a, a carefree and protected childhood. Mr. Katami, would you agree with me that um, parents have the primary responsibility for raising their kids? I agree that parents have a primary responsibility for raising their kids, yes. And a part of that responsibility includes the development of their moral character? Part of that responsibility is that, yes. And part of developing a child's moral character 
would involve issues of human sexuality. Would you agree with that? I can't speak as a parent because I'm not one. I know that myself as a parent, that would be part of my responsibility if I had differing views on certain aspects of sexuality, that would be my responsibility to impart that to my kids. And you testified today that you desire to be a parent ultimately. I do. Would you agree that issues relating to same-sex marriage are for parents to discuss with their children according to their own values and their own beliefs? I think that works in tandem to what they learn in society and in school and then fortified in the home depending on what the home vision is. Do you think that first and second graders should be taught about sex in the public schools? I am not part of any unified school district or school district at all, so I can't speak to what is taught and what is not taught. And you'd have to define what you mean by sex exactly and how that's taught. Well, my question is to you, is it your grade should be taught about sex, in other words, traditional sex education, should that start in first and second grade? You don't think that, do you? No, I haven't thought about it. Sorry. Let me rule on the objection before I give the answer. <laughs> objection overruled. I think the door was open to this line on direct examination. Proceed. Can you repeat the question, please? You don't think that kids as young as first and second grade should be taught a traditional sex ed curriculum, taught about uh, the particulars of sex between uh, individuals, do you? Again, not as a parent. I can't answer that question with any surety. I don't know. It depends on the curriculum, depends on what's being taught and how it's taught. I think kids that are in first and second grade and have the capability to process issues of, of sex. Do you think that, Mr. Katami? I am not an expert on child development. I can't speak for every child across the country. But I do know that children are growing up a lot faster than they used to, so there's a potential yes to that question. You think it would be reasonable for someone, parent, for instance, to disagree with you on that? It's reasonable that they can disagree, yes. And you wouldn't have a problem with the public school teaching about same-sex marriage to first and second graders, would you? Again. I don't know the curriculum of the school system. I don't know what is taught and how it's taught. So I would have to look at the curriculum, see what's being taught, how it's taught. And if it's something I disagreed with in my home and my children came to me and said, this is what I learned, it is my mutual responsibility to impart my vision on those children so they understand that there are altering views or methods. You had a particular objection to the yes on eight campaign ads to the extent that they pulled children into the equation. Isn't that a fact? It was the manner of which they pulled children into the equation, yes. I would like to draw your attention to plaintiff's exhibit one. If we could bring that up, that would be helpful. Previously admitted into evidence. Yes, Your Honor. Now, Mr. Katami, you testified on your direct examination that uh, you had a particular problem with the part of this exhibit, which is the official argument in favor of Prop 8, that um, voting yes would protect our children. You had a problem with that, didn't you? I have an issue. And particularly, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Particularly, you took issue with being associated with something that was bad, that somehow you had to be protected from, from children. You had a problem with that, is that correct? I have an issue with the verbiage saying protect your children, 
because to me that insinuates that you have to protect from something that's going to harm you. And did you find that uh, the ads that brought the children into the equation and claimed that kids might be taught about same-sex marriage in schools was misleading? I did feel it was misleading. I'd like to draw your attention to uh, the, the top of Planets Exhibit 1, the uh, top right-hand column. Do you see that? That's on uh, 003365. You see the, the top right-hand column that starts with, we should not accept? Uh, the resolution is, I can't read it exactly. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Could you read the, uh, the first four lines of that exhibit? We should not accept a court decision that may result in public schools teaching our kids that gay marriage is okay. That is an issue for parents to discuss with their children according to their own values and beliefs. It shouldn't be forced on us against our will. And in fact, that's what the Yes on Prop 8 campaign was seeking to protect children from. Am I right? I can't speak to know exactly what they meant outside of this or with this exactly, but again, the issue is with protect the children. Um, I don't have an issue if it's taught in school. Again, the mutual responsibility is at home with the parent. And ultimately, Proposition 8, for me, had nothing to do with children. We're missing the point completely here. This is, to me, a tactic to divert from what the truth of the situation is, is that the state gave me a right, stripped the right away from me. That right is something I think is inalienably, inalienably mine. And therefore, the issue of children is, in, is angering and is an issue and a problem to me because of the way it's presented. But is it the whole issue? No. Is it what I consider potentially diversion away from the issue? Yes. The fact is you had a particular problem with the ads because you thought they were misleading, that in fact kids were not going to be taught in schools. Isn't that true? At one point, my understanding was to believe that kids may not be taught in school, that it wasn't for a fact sure that e every state that would pass or legalize gay marriage would be required to teach gay marriage in school. So then again, it becomes an issue for me based on the language, the tactic, and what it insinuates, which does not sit at the core of the issue for what, how it affects me. There's nothing in this ad that says that the Yes on Prop 8 campaign wanted to protect children against you because you were bad, right? Didn't say anything like that, did it? This ad doesn't literally state... That's what I'm asking. It doesn't literally state it, does it? it does, this ad does not literally state that there is a harm, but it insinuates one to me. Thank you, Mr. Katami. And the, the video that we played about the couple in Massachusetts mm -hmm. didn't say anything about the fact that same-sex couples were bad. Didn't say that in the, in the ad, did it? That ad did not literally state that same-sex couples are bad, but it's definitely insinuated in the emotion of the ad, in the language of the ad, in the bullet points that were obviously provided for the ad. I mean, yes, to me, that watching that ad absolutely insinuates that there is some disapproval of gay people and that they should be feared, again, using the terminology, protect your family, protect your children. Every time you see that or hear it, to me, it means you are protecting your children or family from something that is going to harm them. Regardless if it states it legitimately, I'm not legitimately, it states it literally or not, it does not legitimize the fact that these, peop these people are allowed to have their beliefs, but the minute they turn a belief into an action, that legally sanctions my rights, there's an issue there. So you believe that parents can disagree on the issue of same-sex marriage, but they have no right to do anything about it? That's not what I said. I see. The fact is that the ad that we, we played that has been admitted to evidence specifically points out that these parents were concerned that their kids would be taught about same-sex marriage in first and second grade. That's what they were concerned with. 
And in fact, it did happen in Massachusetts, didn't it? I don't know for a fact it did. Do you have any evidence or reason to believe that what those parents said on that video was inaccurate? Do you have any evidence to that effect? I do not have any evidence to say that what they're saying is inaccurate, but I also believe that... Opponents of prob... That a, that a video might be playing? Um, it doesn't also exclude, in my mind, the fact that they could be arguing about any other number of things that those kids learn in school. Perhaps parents disagree with a lot of the curriculum, so that is an issue that is then taken to the school board as they did and resulted in the decision that, it was, that had resulted in, in, and therefore the responsibility falls back on them. So do you then open the door for all these parents that disagree with things in schools to, you know, no. I mean, this is an opportunity for them. They took the opportunity to the courts and tried to rectify it in their way, and it didn't fall on their side, but again, they get to have their beliefs. Should they impose those beliefs on others when it comes to legal matters? Not in my eyes. When it comes to talking to their children, perhaps their situation could have been really summed up and wrapped up in a conversation with their child, saying, hey, you know what, you learned that in school, but we don't necessarily believe that in our home, or we don't necessarily agree with that. What then goes to some disapproval towards gay people. And the official, official ballot language indicated that the issue of same-sex marriage should be for parents to discuss with their children according to their own values and beliefs. And you testified that you agreed with that. In addition to that... No, I'm, all I'm asking you is that you, whether you agreed with that. That's the only thing I'm asking you. Agreed with what, sir? Well, yes. With whether same-sex marriage is an issue for parents to discuss with their children according to their own values and beliefs. You agree with that concept, do you not? A concept that parents should be able to discuss that with their children? The one that I just read to you. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm clarifying it for me. So yeah, I didn't write this language. So yes, for me, that means it's in conjunction with societal things. I mean, if they're watching TV, there's a lot of other influences. So does a parent have a responsibility? And is it their right? Absolutely. Does that prohibit people from seeing or learning about other real truths in, the life, in their lives? No. So if they had an outside source, you know, what if their child had gone to a movie and there happened to be a gay character who was married? Would he ask the same question? Perhaps. It's then the parent's responsibility to have that discussion. I want to go back to the first question I asked you, that it's a parent's primary responsibility to raise their kids. And you agree with that? Correct. Okay. And your objection to the um, protect our children theme was one which you thought was misleading, that there was nothing that the kids need to be protected against. Isn't that a fact? Once again, my... I I'm asking you a yes or no question. Did you think that the kids did not need to be protected? Is that let's what just, you thought? Let, let's do one question at a time. Okay. okay. You Can one? you repeat the question, please? Is it your opinion that there was nothing that kids needed to be protected against? It was my opinion. Maybe you can rephrase that, Mr. Rahm. That, Certainly. It's, uh, that is a little you testified, far afield. I'm sorry. <laughs> you testified that you had a problem with the part of what's in evidence as Plaintiff's Exhibit 1 that says that we need to protect our children. You testified to that today, correct? I did. Okay. And the fact is you don't think that kids need to be protected from exposure to same-sex relationships, correct? In my opinion, same-sex relationships are not something to be protected There's from. nothing wrong with it in your opinion, correct? Same-sex relationships, yes. nothing wrong with nothing it. Nothing wrong with it at all. But the fact is that what the Yes on 8 campaign was pointing out that is that kids would be taught about same-sex relationships in first and second grade. Isn't that a fact that that's what they were referring to? I don't know that for a fact in first and second grade. Well. Do you recall when you took your deposition, right? Yes. That was December 10th, 2009. Correct. I'd like to refer to page 63 of the deposition transcript. Your Honor, do you have a copy? I believe the clerk is retrieving it right now. 
Well, what uh, page, Mr. Rom? That's page 63, Your Honor. Well. And does the witness have a copy of his deposition? It's on the screen here. Ah. Okay. Reading from your deposition, that's dated December 10th, 2009, starting at line 18. It says, question, okay. When you talk about the points regarding the schools, are you referring to the assertion that kids would be taught about same-sex marriage in the schools? Answer, it was multifold. It was about the kids, comma, textbooks being written to exclude same-sex marriage, excuse me, textbooks being written to include same-sex marriage. Please, rewritten. 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 Start again. Answer. It was multifold. It was about the kids' textbooks being rewritten to include same-sex marriage. Part of the campaign, from what I remember, also for the campaigning that was revolved around kids being taken to a lesbian wedding as a school outing, and how that would be acceptable. And potentially there would be school outings to gay marriages, and so on and so forth. Question, and was it your position that that was a misrepresentation that would not happen and could not happen? Answer, from my understanding, from following news stories and trying to be as educated as possible, from my understanding that was absolutely not the case or was not going to be the case, that there wasn't going to be an immediate reprinting of textbooks or permission slips to go to gay marriage. We asked those questions, and did you give those answers? I did. I'd like to refer to Plaintiff's Exhibit 15, and uh, I would move it into evidence uh, if there's no obje objection. Page. Opponents of Prop 8 said gay marriage has nothing to. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> this is exhibit what, uh, Mr. Rom? This is exhibit uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 15. 15. All right. PX 15. If you don't, if you're not familiar with that, we can play it and. Uh, campaign video. Um, yes. Very well. You're seeking to admit 15, correct? Yes, Your Honor. Very well. 15 will be admitted. <clears throat> A 
Opponents of Prop 8 said gay marriage has nothing to do with schools. Then a public school took first graders to a lesbian wedding, calling it a teachable moment. Now this politician says schools aren't <coughs> required to teach about marriage. Yet his official website confirms teaching marriage is required in 96% of schools. And a leading Prop 8 opponent has warned parents cannot remove children from this instruction. Unless we vote yes on Proposition 8, children will be taught about gay marriage. Whether you like it or not. No further questions. Very well. Redirect uh, Mr. Boyce. <clears throat> Do you understood it? Was there anything in Proposition 8 about what was going to be taught in schools? No. Was there anything in Proposition 8 that talked about whether kids would be taught about sex in second grade as opposed to sixth grade or eighth grade? To my understanding, not at all. No more questions, John. Very well, then, uh, Mr. Katani, you may step down, sir. Now you have to be on call for at least 48 hours for possible further questions with respect to Exhibit 401. But with that, you may step down, sir. Thank you. Plaintiff's next witness. The plaintiffs would call uh, Plaintiff Kristen Perry. I do. Kristen Matthews Perry. K R I S T I N P E R R Y. Ms. Perry, are you a plaintiff in this case? Yes, I am. Would you tell us briefly about your background, um, where you were born, just a brief summary, your age? Um, your educational background. Uh, just a brief summary, please. I was born in Illinois, but my parents moved here with me when I was two years old. So I have lived in California since I was two years old, and I'm 45 year old, years old now. I've um, grown up, I grew up in Bakersfield, California. I attended grammar school, middle school, high school there. And then I moved away to go to college at UC Santa Cruz. And from there, I went to San Francisco State to get my master's degree in social work. And I have worked in the Bay Area ever since. Describe without, you don't have to identify the, the name of your employer, but you work, just, you, uh, you work for a government agency. I'd like you to describe the work that you do, your profession. I've, in my entire career, I have worked in the field of uh, child protection, child development, family support. I started out as a child abuse investigator in a Bay Area County, and from there I moved into prevention services for families that were at risk. I became a supervisor and a program manager, and then later on became the executive director of a county agency that supported at-risk children, zero to five. And at this time, I am the executive director of a statewide agency that provides services and support to families with children, zero to five. So how long have you professionally been engaged in the occupation of working with children? For almost 25 years. On behalf of government agencies of the state of California, is that, did I hear that correctly? Uh, I have spent my entire career working for the government. What is your relationship with plaintiff Sandra Steer? Um, well, Sandy is the woman I love and uh, we live together in Berkeley. And what is the uh, co um, composition of your family? Is it just the two of you? No, Sandy and I live together in Berkeley with our children. We have a blended family. Uh, we both brought two sons um, into our relationship, and Sandy's children are college age, and my children are high school age. When did you meet Ms. Steyer, Steer? Sandy and I met in, um, oh, I think, 1996, uh, while we were both working at this same place. And describe how that relationship, again, in general terms, how did that relationship grow and what, it di what did it grow into? 
Well, I remember the, the first time I met Sandy thinking she was maybe the sparkliest person I'd ever met. And, um, and I wanted to be her friend. And we were friends for a few years. And, and our friendship became more and more, um, it became deeper and deeper over time. And, and, and then after a few years, I, I began to feel that I might be falling in love with her. And did it work out that way? And it, it did work out that way. I did fall in love with her. I did. And how did she feel about you? Um, she told me she loved me too. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be asking her to verify that. Uh, okay. <laughs> would you, how do you, would you describe your sexual orientation? I am a lesbian. And tell me what that means in your own words. What does it mean to be a lesbian? Well, for me, what it means is uh, I've always felt a, a strong uh, attraction and interest in women and uh, have formed really st close relationships with women, and I've only ever fallen in love with women. And um, m the happiest I feel is in my relationship with Sandy and b because I'm in love with her. It, it, do you feel um, that that's something that could change, that you could uh, have, could you have been in the past interested in that same kind of bonding with men, or do you feel that that would be, I know this is somewhat compound, or do you feel that that could be, uh, turn into, that that could develop in that way in the future? Let's see. All right, we'll take it. Question do you want her to answer? Uh -huh. <laughs> do you feel that in the past you could have developed that same kind of bond with a man? I, I was an, unable to do that. I, I, as I said, grew up in Bakersfield, California, and it was in the 70s and 80s, and all of my friends, as we were getting older and they were beginning to date, became more and more interested in boys, and, and I recognized that that was something that would have been the best thing for me to do if I could, and I, and I did date a few boys because it was, it did make life easier, it, you know, then I would have a date to go to the prom too, or I could go to a party too. But as I got a little bit older, it became clear to me that I, I didn't feel the same way my friends did about boys, and that there was something different about me. you feel that you were born um, with those feelings, with that kind of sexual orientation? Yes, I do. You feel that it could change in the future, do you? Do you have a sense that it might somehow change? I'm 45 years old. I, I don't think so. <laughs> Why are you a plaintiff in this case? Because I want to marry Sandy. I, I want to have a, a stable and secure relationship with her that then we can include our children in. And it, I want the discrimination we're feeling with Proposition 8 to end and for a more positive, joyful part of our lives to begin. What does the institution of marriage mean to you? Why do you want that? Well, I re really never let myself want it until now. Growing up as a lesbian, you, you, you don't let yourself want it because everyone tells you you're never going to have it. So it, in some ways, it's hard for me to grasp what it would even mean. But I do see other people who are married, and I, and I, I think what it looks like is that you're honored and respected by your, your family. Your children know what your relationship is. And when you leave your home and you go to work or you, you go out in the world, people know what your relationship means. And so then everyone can, in a sense, join, join in supporting your relationship, which at this point, I, I can only observe it as an outsider. I don't have any firsthand experience with, with what that must be like. Does it matter that the state is announcing that this is a relationship officially recognized by the state of California, marriage? Yes. And, would, and, and is that part of something that goes into why you want this to happen for you? I want it to happen for me because 
I do everything else I can think to do to make myself a contributing, responsible member of this state. And the state isn't letting me feel happy. It's not letting me experience my full potential because I'm not permitted to experience everything I might feel if, if this barrier were removed. Did you and Ms. Steer ever attempt to be married? We did. Now, tell us what happened, when that was, and exactly what your experience was. Well, in, in 2003, I proposed to Sandy without any way of knowing that, that everything that's developed around gay marriage in California was about to develop. And instead, I did it as a way to express my personal interest in marrying her. Tell me about your proposal. What, what happened? Well. It was around Christmas, and we live in a part of Berkeley that's sort of hilly, and we live near this big rock called Indian Rock. And if you get up high enough on it and you sit there, you can see everything in the Bay Area out, laid out in front of you. And I knew I wanted to propose to her there because we could always walk back there and sit there if we wanted to. So I took her on a walk, and she didn't know that I had a ring, and we sat down on the rock, and I, I put my arm around her, and I said, will you marry me? And and she looked really happy, and then she looked really confused. <laughs> and she said, well, what does that mean? Well, she said, yes. And then she said, well, what does that mean? How, how will we even do that? And, um, and then we had to invent it for ourselves. We we'd had to figure out what to do. So that was in December of 2003. So what did you, and I'm going to call her Sandy, um, what did you and Sandy do to then invent the relationship that you were hoping to have with her, that you would propose? We, we started um, with basically trying to figure out the day we would like to be married and the place and who we would like to have join us and how we might, what we might say to each other. So we, we just started the planning. And as we were in the midst of doing that, um, private family and friends ceremony planning, um, we learned that in the city and county of San Francisco, they were permitting same-sex marriages. Uh, that was while we were in the middle of planning. This was early in 2004. That's that correct. Right? Mm -hmm. And you learned in some way that the mayor of the city of San Francisco had authorized the issuance of marriage licenses and the performance of marriage in San Francisco. Am I stating that correctly? Yes. Uh, was that, that was in the early part of 2004? Yes, for us it was February of 2004. And what did you did you act on that information? I did. I, um, I, Sandy and I both were were reading about it in the newspaper, and we talked about whether or not we would want to also would go to San Francisco to have this uh, marriage and then continue with our other plans. And that's what we decided we want to do. So we made an appointment and we went to City Hall, and we brought. Um, all of the boys and my mom and we were married in City Hall. And how did you feel about that marriage coming about in the City Hall in San Francisco at that time? Well, as, as amazed and um, happy as I could ever imagine feeling, and I said a moment ago that I, I never let myself imagine it happening. So in some ways, the feelings I had were new to me. I, I didn't really know what they were. And I, I'm still confused by, by these experiences because they're not the ones that um, have been, I, I haven't let myself want to feel them. So I, 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 I have a sense that you know, it's almost an otherworldly experience of like floating above the ceremony and saying, oh, that's me getting married. I never thought that would happen. Did you then, after that ceremony, go forward with this private um, ceremony that you had planned? We did. We continued those plans uh, because only a few, my, our kids and my mom attended the, the ceremony in City Hall. We wanted to continue with the other ceremonies so that more people could come and we could see everybody. Did you have a party, a ceremony, and a, um, an exchange of vows? We did. We, um, we did. We planned a an afternoon in Berkeley where our friends and family joined us and we had a, a, a small ceremony and then we all came inside and there was a big celebration. How many? How many people? There were a hundred guests. What, what month was that? 
It was August 1st. Of 2004? Yes. After that, was there a decision by um, a California court having to do with the ceremony that you entered into in San Francisco at City Hall? Yes. A few weeks after our August ceremony, the uh, state Supreme Court ruled that the San Francisco weddings were invalid. What was your reaction when you heard that? Well, the part of me that was disbelieving and unsure of it in the first place was confirmed that in in fact i I really it almost when you're when you're gay, you think you don't really deserve things so it it did have this sense of well, you know, I really didn't deserve to be married received notification. Official notification that your marriage was null and void. Yeah, the, the the city and county of San Francisco sent us a letter after they after the ruling, and it it was a form letter, and our names were typed at the top. It said, "We're sorry to inform you that your marriage is um, not valid, and um, it, we'd like to return your marriage fees to you. Would you like them in a cat in a check or donated to charity and um, and so that was the, f that's when we knew for sure we weren't married in San Francisco anymore. And what feelings did that evoke, that experience? I'm not good enough to be married. Sometime in uh, 2008, the California Supreme Court rendered a decision, I think it was May of 2008, that marriage could be obtained by same-sex individuals, um, irrespective of sexual orientation. Do you remember that decision? I do. What did you feel when you heard that the California Supreme Court said that you had a constitutional right to marry the person of your choice? I, I was elated to hear it. It, it, I really was, and, and I know Sandy was too, because we talked about that ruling when it happened. And, and after we'd known about it for a little while, we started to hear our friends talk about their plans to get married, and we were very excited for them. And then, of course, we asked ourselves, would, would, we, get, would we get married again? And it didn't take more than a, really a few minutes for us to, it was unanimous that we couldn't, we couldn't bring ourselves to do it again right then. Um, the experience in 2004 hadn't really, we hadn't really recovered from it, and it didn't feel at that time, given what was going on outside of the Supreme Court ruling in the political world, that there was necessarily a permanent solution there, and, and we had experienced the impermanent solution before, so we decided not to go forward at that time. Were you aware that people were organizing an effort to overturn that California Supreme Court decision? Uh, yes, I was aware there was a campaign s starting. What became Proposition 8? You were aware that there was effort going on to put a measure on the ballot to <coughs> overturn the California Supreme Court decision? I remember um, media reports of, of gr groups or individuals saying, we disagree and we'll have to take action and the, the sort of beginnings of what resulted in a, a, a ballot initiative. And that was a ballot initiative that came on the ballot in November of that same year, is that correct? Correct. Now, what was it like for you to be a citizen, to watch and listen to the campaign to overturn that California? Can you just relate your reactions to what was going on around you in the political world um, on that subject? Well, I, I mean, I am just, I'm a California resident, so I could see evidence of the campaign. I commute uh, on a local highway, and I would see the bumper stickers every day. I um, did see some of the television ads, one in particular I remember. I, I saw some posters in people's lawns, but you know, that was about it. Well, what did you, you, you say you saw one ad in particular. What, what do you remember about that? Um, well, it struck me as being a, sort of an education-focused ad because there was a, a moment where they 
they showed the ed code in the ad. Education code. The education, California education code, which I was sort of interested in. So that, that, that got me interested in that ad. And it, and it did talk about needing to protect your children from learning about gay marriage in school. That was the gist, gist of the ad. How did you feel about that? You work with children every day. I do. Well, I, I work on their behalf. I, I remember feeling that um, the ad was attempting to create a sense of fear and worry in me, and that the solution to that would be to vote yes on eight. It was kind of a kind of a this for that kind of a feeling. Like they kind of simplified this complex thing about relationships into a bad thing. And then they said, if you want to fix a bad thing, do this. And I, I felt essentially that it was, it was very simplified. As a parent, did you have a reaction to the Proposition 8 campaign? Mm -hmm. I did. I, I, um, I felt that it didn't represent how I feel about m my children or their friends that that um, that I feel compelled all the all of the time to be protective of them, just without thinking. And and so this 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 message was that maybe I was in a group of people who wouldn't be protective of children, and and it didn't match with the way I feel about. You, did children. you feel that voters were being warned that they needed to protect their children from you? Yes, I did. And I felt like I was being used, that my, the fact that I, you know, I am the way I am, and I can't change the way I am, was being mocked and made fun of and disparaged in a way that I, like, there really didn't have any way to respond to it. I just had to know that it, people felt that way. You, as you go through your life every day, feel that um, the other effects of discrimination uh, on the basis of your sexual orientation? Every day. Plus, about that. Well, uh, when I was an adolescent and beginning to become more and more way aware of se my sexuality, I I struggled to to feel like everybody else, to look and feel like everybody else, and for it to even be a struggle in the first place was hard. And I was well aware of the um, comments and jokes that were circulating through my school all the time, and some of them were directed at me. Um, and as I got older and clearer about who I was and I could say I was a lesbian out loud, that um, would be met at times with criticism or skepticism. And what I want to say about me and being out is, you know, I go to great lengths to not have that happen. I don't want to draw people's criticism. In fact, quite the opposite. I would really like people to like me. So since I know I have this trait that I can't change that people don't like, I go to great lengths to have other traits people do like. So I put a significant amount of time and energy into being likable so that when the discriminatory things happen, either I can turn it around. So if, for example, I'm on a plane and somebody comes up and I have saved a seat for Sandy, but she's not there yet. And they say, is that saved? And I say, yes. And they say, for whom? And I say, for my partner. And they say, could you please move that so I can sit here? Or if we're in a restaurant or in a store and we travel through the store together, people want to know if we're sisters or cousins or friends. And I have to decide every day if I want to come out everywhere I go and take the chance that somebody will have a hostile reaction to my sexuality or just go there and buy the microwave we went there to buy without having to go through that again. And 
the decision every day to come out or not come out at work, at home, at PTA, at music, at soccer is exhausting. So m much of the time I just choose to do as much of that as I can handle doing in any given day. Was coming out um, something that took a long time for you to do or was it difficult? It was sort of gradual, but probably not so long. I think by the time I was 18 or 19, I did know that. I was able to talk to myself about that, and then I could tell other people over the next few years. But it's, it is what you often hear lesbians and gays say. I, I feel like once I realized that about myself, then I could, then I could say, wait, I think I've been gay from the beginning. Um, but it was a gradual process to, at first. You've had to explain this to your children? Yes. Was that difficult? Well, they don't know me any other way. So, I, you know, it's, it's different probably if you were living as a heterosexual person and then, but for me, I've always been their mom and, I, and in, in their entire lives I've been out, so. Have you and Sandy entered into a uh, registered domestic partnership in California? Yes. Tell us when you did that. That was in August of 2004. Is that easy to do? Does California make it simple? Yeah, it was a, I think it was a, a form. That you submit to the state? That we, we completed it. I think we had to have it notarized, and then we mailed it in. What does domestic partnership mean to you compared to marriage? Well, uh, we're registered domestic partners based on um, just legal advice that we receive for creating an estate plan. So we saw a lawyer who works with couples on those things and we completed a number of forms, the durable power of attorney and a what last will and testament. And she recommended we also do the domestic partnership agreement at the same time. So there were just a number of those kinds of documents that we completed. Uh, that's a, you regard it as something of a property transaction or a state planning transaction? Is that? It was well. That's when we can we did ours during that process, and it was uh, I believe it has some unique features that it was a little different than durable power of attorney or a will, um, and so uh, we completed it. It it allows us to access each other's health benefits and some other benefits through our employers. Is it as good as marriage. Well, they're, to me, they're, they're not the same thing at all. I, you know, I viewed the domestic partnership agreement as precisely that, an agreement, a, le a legal agreement, and um, in some ways memorializes our, some of our responsibilities to each other. But it isn't the same thing as um, a celebration or something we, uh, we don't remember the day it happened uh, or invite people over on that day. Uh, we just did that as part of the things we did as a couple to protect ourselves since we can't get married. One of the issues that the court is going to have to deal with is how is that domestic partnership relationship different to you than marriage? And why is it that you want marriage so much when you have this opportunity? Well, I don't have... I don't have access to the words that describe my relationship right now. I, I'm a 45-year-old woman. I've been in love with the, a woman for 10 years, and I don't have a word to tell anybody about that. I don't have a word. Word do it? Well, why would everybody be getting married if it didn't do anything? I think it must do something. I, it appears to be really important to people, and I would really like to use the word too because it, it symbolizes maybe the most important decision you make as an adult, who you choose. No one does it for you. You weren't born with that as your cousin, or your uncle, or your aunt. You chose them over everybody else, and you, and you want to feel that it's going to stick and that you'll have the protection and the support and the inclusion that comes from letting other people know that you feel that way.
you think it would matter in your neighborhood, in your community, that you would be able to say that you and Sandy were married? Would it cause tr people to treat you differently? I think it would be an enormous relief to our friends who are married, are straight, heterosexual friends that are married, almost view us in a way, I, I know they love us, but I think they feel sorry for us, and I, I can't stand it. Um, you know, many of them are either in their second marriage or you know, their first marriage, but nevertheless, they have a word and they belong to this, this institution or this group. And I can think of a time recently where I went with Sandy happily to a football game at the high school where our, our, uh, two of our kids go. And we went up the bleachers and we were greeted with these smiling faces of other parents sitting there waiting for the game to start. And I was so acutely aware at that moment, I thought, they're all married, and I'm not. It sounds to me like your heterosexual friends don't feel threatened if you were to get married. That same-sex marriage doesn't sound like it threatens them. No, the friends we have, uh, I think, would feel better about their marriages if we could be married, too. It would they would feel like they get to help support our family in a way that is familiar to them, makes sense to them. Right now, they're a little bit unsure, just like we are, of what, what we all should be doing, because we're outside of any sort of tradition. It's just this thing we invented that no one but us understands. Heard the argument, I think, probably, and, um in various different places that allowing you to get married to a person of the same sex would damage the institution, the traditional institution of marriage. Do you agree? Objection, Your Honor. Call for expert testimony. Have you discussed with Sandy the impact on the marriage relationship itself um, if you were to pr prevail in this lawsuit? 